Greetings and welcome to Intermediate Algebra, Rational Expressions and Rational Functions. Lesson 5.1, Basic Properties and Reducing to Lowest Terms. We worked with rational numbers and uh, here's just the definition of the rational number. You have an integer in the numerator and an integer in the denominator and that is a rational number. And we never want to let our denominator to be zero right now. In higher math, we're allowed to let it be zero, but right now we're not going to allow the denominator to be zero. A rational expression is very similar to a rational number, except the components of the numerator and the denominator are set up to be expressions. So, uh, P over Q is a rational expression if P and Q are polynomials and Q does not equal zero. So here are some examples. 2x minus 3 all over x plus 5. x squared minus 5x plus 6 all over x squared minus 1. And A minus B all over B minus A. These are all examples of what a rational expression can look like. We do have a couple of basic properties, just like we do with our rational numbers. We have equivalent rational expressions. Let's say that P and Q and K are all polynomials. And we don't want Q to be zero, and we don't want K to be zero. Then the same idea of, equi of equivalent numbers like 1 half will equal 2 fourths, which will equal 3 six. Well, we have that same idea for a rational expression. If we have a rational expression P over Q, and we multiply both P and Q by K, we've only changed the look of it. We haven't changed the value of it. It's a, it is an equivalent rational expression. And likewise, just like we were allowed to divide by the same value with a rational number, we're allowed to uh, divide by the same polynomial if we have a rational expression. So P over K, or P over Q, if we divide both P by K and Q by K, is just an equivalent rational expression. We have the ability to reduce to lowest terms regular fractions or rational numbers. We also have the same technique for rational expressions. So let's recall 6 over 8. Well, we can write it in lowest terms as 3 over 4 because a 6 we can write as 2 times 3 and an 8 we can write as 2 times 2 times 2. They both have a 2, so we can reduce by dividing by 2, both the numerator and the denominator. Or you can think of it as 2 over 2 is a big fat 1, and when you multiply 1 to anything, it doesn't change its value. Therefore, we can reduce by 2, both the numerator and the denominator, and in lowest terms, 6 eighths is 3 fourths. In rational expressions, well, just like how I did it for the 6 eighths, we looked at 6 and broke it down into its factors, and we took 8 and broke it down into its factors, and we looked to see what they both have in common. Rational expressions are very similar. So we're going to factor P, in other words, the numerator, factor the denominator, and then divide out and, re or, and or reduce by the common factor. The most difficult part about this is that those factors have to be exactly alike. x plus 2 is not x plus 1. An x plus 2 has to match up with an x plus 2, that type of idea. So let's reduce x squared minus 9 all over x minus 3. And we want to reduce it down to lowest terms. We're going to factor the numerator. x squared minus 9 factors into x minus 3, x plus 3. And we're going to leave the denominator as is because that can't be factored. 
and lo and behold, they have an x minus 3 in common. So we can divide that out, and we get x plus 3 all over 1, but we can write that as x, minus, x plus 3. Now, here's our reduced version of our rational expression. x squared, plus, uh, x squared minus 9 all over x minus 3 will equal x plus 3 for all values except x equals 3. Here's the reason why x cannot equal 3. In our original problem, our denominator is x minus 3. And we do not want to let this be 0. If it's 0, then unfortunately we have a z we don't want this value, x minus 3, to equal 0. If we do, well, then we have a fraction with a 0 in the denominator and we have a problem. So we always want to try and figure out what value forces the denominator to be 0. And if we do have a value that forces it to be 0, then we're going to restrict what x can be. In other words, x can be anything except 3 for this problem. All right, let's look at another one. Let's look at y squared minus 5y minus 6 all over y squared minus 1. First step, let's factor both the numerator and then the denominator. The numerator, y squared minus 5y minus 6, will factor into x minus 6, x plus 1. And the denominator, y squared minus 1, will factor into y minus 1 and y plus 1. Now we can see that they have a y plus 1 in common, and well, anything over itself is 1, so we can reduce that down to y minus 6 over y minus 1. Now again, we want to be very aware of what values y can't be. And y can't be a value as in a 1 or a, po a negative 1. Because if you have a 1, well, 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. That's a bad value. And a negative 1 squared is 1. And 1 minus 1 is uh, 0. So that is another quote unquote bad value. So we're going to make it a restriction that y can be anything it wants to be except y cannot be positive 1 and y cannot be negative 1. Let's look at another problem. 2a cubed minus 16 all over 4a squared minus 12a plus 8. Again, our first step is always going to be to factor the numerator and the denominator if possible. All right, 2, a cubed minus 16. Well, there is a GCF in there of a 2. And then we have a cubed minus 8. The a cubed minus 8 is a perfect cube. So we can factor it into 2. a minus 2, a squared plus 2a plus 4. At this point, the numerator is completely factored. Let's look at the denominator. 4a squared minus 12a plus 8. Again, it has a GCF of a 4 this time, leaving us with 4 times a squared minus 3a plus 2. a squared minus 3a plus 2 can be factored into a minus 2, a plus 1. So completely factored, it is 4. a minus 2 times a minus 1. And now we're looking to reduce. Well, 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 4 twice. We have an a minus 2 in the numerator, a minus 2 in the denominator. That can be factored out as well. 
and therefore we've reduced down all of the factors they have in common to a y, uh, pardon me, a squared plus 2a plus 4 all over a minus 1. We should be aware of what a should not be allowed to be. In this case, in the original amount, we have a should not be allowed to be 2 right there and a should not be allowed to be 1 in the second term. So a can be anything but 2 or 1. These are going to be our restrictions on what a can be. And when you start finding restrictions, um, you need to be aware that you just don't want it to be 0. In the past, when we were solving uh, with factoring, that was different. We were looking for those special values that forced it to be 0. In this case, again, we're looking for those special values that force it to be zero, but then we're going to rule them out of the domain. We're not going to allow A to be those two special values or three special values. All right, one more. X squared minus three X plus A X minus three A all over X squared minus A X minus three X plus a, uh, 3a. Well, since we have four terms, grouping is going to be our best bet for factoring. And if we group these, you can see all the steps in between, it comes down to x plus a times x minus 3 and x minus a times x minus 3. They both have an x minus 3 in common. So we're going to factor that out, leaving us with our reduced uh, rational expression of a uh, x plus a over x minus a. Sometimes it looks like you can't factor anything, but occasionally there's a hidden negative 1 in there. If you have uh, a rational uh, a rational expression, that has something like a minus b in the numerator and a b minus a in the denominator. There's a hidden negative one there. Because if I rewrote the denominator as negative a plus b, then you can see that both the a, the a in the numerator will be a positive a, the a in the denominator would be a negative a, the b in the, uh, the, b in the numerator will be negative, and the b in the denominator will be positive. All the signs are opposites of one another. And therefore, you can factor out in the denominator, or in that case, a numerator, a negative 1. So you have a minus b over b minus a. Let's factor out a negative a in the denominator. And we get negative a times a minus b. Well, we can see we have an a minus b in the numerator, those can factor out, reduce down, and we're left with a positive 1 over a negative 1, which is a negative 1. In the second example, we have x squared minus 25 over 5 minus x. Another clue that might be a negative 1 in there is when you have the numeric amount, uh, like 5 in this case, leading the expression we would normally write this as x in front, your variable in front, and not your constant in front. That's usually a clue that there might be a hidden negative 1 here. If we factor the, the numerator, we get x minus 5 all multiplied by x plus 5. If we factor the denominator, we can factor a negative 1 out of there and we are left with uh, x minus 5 times x plus 5 all over negative. If it helps, you can put a 1 in there, a negative 1. And negative 1 times x minus 5. They both have an x minus 5 in common, so we can reduce that down to x plus 5 all over negative 1. And we wouldn't leave the negative 1 down in the denominator. We can just rewrite it as either negative 1 times the quantity x, minus five, x plus 5 
or again, we can imply the one and just say negative times x plus five. A rational function is any function that can be written in terms of where, let's say f of x equals p of x all over q of x, where p of x is a polynomial and q of x is a polynomial. But again, because it's in fraction form, we don't want q of x to be equaled to zero. So let's see an example. f of x equals x minus four over x minus two. Well, x minus four is a polynomial, x minus two is a polynomial. So we are a rational function here. Let's find our values for f of zero, f of negative four, f of four, f of negative two, and one should be a positive two. Okay, so we'll do the last one should be a positive two, and I'll change that, positive two. Four, f of zero. Wherever we see an x, we're gonna plug in a zero. Zero minus four is negative four. Zero minus two is negative two, and we can reduce this negative four over negative two down to, well, a negative over a negative is a positive, so that's four over two, and well, four over two is a two. So f of zero equals two. Let's try f of negative four. Wherever we see an x, we're gonna plug in a negative four. Negative four minus four, all over negative four minus two. Negative four minus four is negative eight. Negative four minus two is negative six. And again, we have a negative over a negative, which is a positive. Uh, eight over six and eight over six can reduce down to four thirds. So f of negative four equals four thirds. Let's try f of four. Wherever we see an x, we're gonna plug in a four. Four minus four, all over four minus two. Four minus four is zero. Four minus two is two. Zero over two equals zero. Now remember, we're completely allowed to have a zero in the numerator. It's the denominator that we have a problem with. So a zero in the numerator is perfectly fine, and two goes into zero zero times, so the answer is zero. F of four equals zero. Now let's try f of a negative two. f of negative two, wherever we see the x, we're gonna plug in a negative two. Negative two minus four, all over negative two minus two. Well, negative two minus four is negative six. Negative two minus two is negative four, and negative six over negative four will reduce down to three halves. So again, we have a great value of three halves. All right, let's try f of two. f of two will equal two minus four all over two minus two. Two minus four is negative two, and two minus two is zero. Therefore, we have a zero in the denominator. Our answer is undefined, or you can also say D and E does not exist. Two will be our restriction on this function. It could be any value we want to plug in, except two causes the issue where z uh, there will be a zero in the denominator and it will be undefined. The domain of a rational function. Well, the domain is just the values we are allowed to put in for our variable. So our function is f of x equals p of x over q of x and we, our domain is all of the x's in which q of x is not zero. So all the values we are allowed to put in without the denominator to be zero. This is going to be our restriction on our variable. So let's find the domain of a few functions. All right, f of x equals x minus four over x minus two. We do not care about the numerator. The numerator can be 
anything it absolutely wants to be. It is the denominator that we have the restriction on. So if we set the denominator to equal zero, we'll figure out the value that forces it to be zero, and that's going to be our restriction. So our denominator is x minus two. Let's set it equal to zero and solve for x, and we get x equals two. Therefore, our domain is all x's such that x is not two. X can be everything else, but X is not two. That's how you read it. All X's such that X does not equal two. Let's try another one. G of X, let's say it equals X squared plus five all over X plus one. Again, don't care about the numerator whatsoever at this point. We're only looking at the denominator. So let's set the denominator to zero to see what value forces the denominator to be zero. X plus one equals zero, therefore X equals negative one will cause the denominator to be zero. The domain is X such that X does not equal zero. Again, when we were solving to figure out when is it zero, that's gonna be our restriction. Try one more h of x equals x all over x squared minus nine. Again, don't care about the numerator. Let's focus on the denominator. I'm going to set the denominator equal zero. And in this case, I'm going to factor the left-hand side into x minus three times quantity x plus three and set it to equal and solve each of those using our zero factor property. And we get x equals three and x equals negative three. These are two values that force the denominator to be zero. Therefore, our domain is x such that x cannot equal negative three and x cannot equal three. The difference quotients. Well, let's take um, the slope of the line through P and Q, where this red line this red line is a function, y equals f of x. It's not a nice straight line, it's some curvy thing. And uh, we've created a line that goes through a couple of points that are on this function. We'll call this q, and we'll call this one p. Okay. Well, this line certainly has a slope. And we're going to figure out a formula to where we can find our slope of this blue line. Well, that's going to be the f of x. That's kind of like our y2 minus f of a, which is our y1 all over x. Well, that's like our x2 minus a, which is like our y2. So our old function for, or our old formula for our slope was y2 minus y1 all over x2 over x1. We're just calling these things a little bit by different name because these values come from a different place. They come from this function, this red function, and we forced a line through it. Okay. So nothing's changed in essence of how we calculate the slope, just the names have changed. So our slope is now going to be f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. They're just points. That's all they are, they're points. So let's try one. If f of x is 3x minus 5, we're going to find f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Now for this particular function, this is totally overkill. Uh, we have a better way of doing it, but let's go ahead and try it because it's a fairly simple function to try this out on. 
f of x equals, well, 3x minus 5. And f of a, wherever we see an x, we're going to plug it in a, that will equal 3a minus 5. Now let's plug it into our f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. We get 3x minus 5 minus 3a minus 5 all over x minus a. Distribute this negative and we get 3x minus 5 minus 3a plus 5 all over x minus a. Well, the 5s will cancel out and we're left with 3x minus 3a all over x minus a. Factor the numerator. We'll get 3 times x minus a all over x minus a. The x minus a, lovely, but uh, cancel out and we're left with 3. Now, let's go back to our original f of x. That is a line and, well, if we said it was y equals 3x minus 5, it's a line in the form of y equals mx plus b, and therefore the m in this case is 3, and therefore we took a very long route, long route to get to 3, right? But it's possible. Like I said, this is overkill for this particular function. If this function was more complex, this would be a better way of trying to figure out the slope. All right, let's do try uh, a more complex equation, a function. Let's say f of x is now x squared minus four, and we're gonna find f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. This is our slope. We're going to find the slope of this line. All right, f equals x squared minus 4. f of a equals a squared minus 4. We're going to plug it into our function, uh, our formula. Here's our formula. And we get x squared minus 4 minus a squared minus 4. Let's distribute this negative and we get x squared minus 4 minus a squared plus 4 all over x minus a. The minus 4 and the plus 4 cancel out and we're left with x squared minus a squared all over x minus a. Factor the numerator. x minus a times x plus a all over x minus a. The x minus a's will cancel out, and we are left with x plus a. Now, x and a are just constants, but it does matter where these points are. If x is 3 and a is 2, our slope is 5. If x is 5 and a is 1, our slope is 6. Our slope is not constant. It's not a constant 3. It is an ever-changing slope depending on where you are in the function. And as you see on this picture with this red line, if I am at this point, I have a different slope than at this point. And if I'm at this point, I have a different slope than I do at this point way over here. And because of that, this slope changes depending on where I am. Now let's reword our um, slope function, just a slope formula, just a little bit. Instead of x and a, let's just call it our y2 is, well, where we started with a little bit more. So x plus some value. So if I started at 1 and I added 1, then my next value is 2. Okay, that's how it works. Just you, wherever you start, you just add a little bit more. Okay, so our y2 is going to be that x plus a little bit more. And where we started was the f of x. Okay, so our y2 is the f of x plus h 
our y1 is our where we started, f of x. And that's all over our change. Well, the reason why it's all over h, because we're already doing the math. 2 minus 1 is our h. So we're kind of skipping the uh, x2 minus x1 and just saying it's h. Now, if we follow the same techniques and plug in our uh, functions, we will actually still solve for the slope. So I'm going to leave this up to you. There's two of them to look through. One, our function is the 3x minus 5, and you plug it in using wherever you see it in eight, uh, x, you're going to plug in h plus, bleh, wherever you see it in x, you're going to plug in an x plus h to find f of x plus h. And then the second one, you're going to do the same thing. Wherever you see an x, like x squared minus 4, wherever you see this x, you're going to plug in the x plus h. This is actually the start, or your first look, at the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is how we do it in calculus. Uh, so go ahead and look through, and I would say practice all of these steps. The first one is very similar to how we did it with uh, f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. In this case, we're just using this new formula. We still get 3. In the second, you see it's slightly different. Uh, take your time with this one, but uh, work through the steps and see that the slope is actually 2x plus h, where h is that little itty bitty bit that we added to our x value. All right, that's it for this lecture. Until next time, be seeing you.